Good morning, church family, and good morning to all of our guests. You are honored guests this morning, and we are so glad to have you. Since the beginning of the year, we're in a wonderful, exciting new sermon series on fundamentals, fundamentals of our faith. Fundamentals are the building blocks of any kind of endeavor, and you can never get past the fundamentals. If you do, you'll not be successful. You must always keep these fundamentals, whatever they are in your particular endeavor, in mind. And so is true with our faith. So when Jesus began his ministry, his first sermon recorded is called the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't matter whether it's on a mount or by the seashore. These are the fundamental principles that he gave to us about Christian living. The first eight some call seven, of these precepts found in the first chapter there, in chapter five, are called the be attitudes, the attitudes that are to be ours if we're going to be his. And these be attitudes unlock the doors of spiritual development and blessed living. When we have these be attitudes in our lives, the blessedness is an inner tranquility that all of us are looking for, the peace that passes all understanding in our lives. The world is looking for this. We have it in New Testament Christianity. Now, when I tell you how we get it, you'll see why so many folks don't have it. Because it's a com completely different mindset to that of the world, different lifestyle to that of the world. For instance, the first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Talk to anybody in the world, and they will tell you that the theme is take care of number one. Take care of being yourself. Make sure you get what you want in life. It's the me generation. But Christ says, if you're going to follow me, you'll become poor in spirit. It's not about me, but it's about thee and about ye, about God and about others how we look at ourselves. The second beatitude is even more graphic, graphic because it talks about in the world, everybody says, be happy, be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. He says, mourn your sins. Oh, sin is not even used in our vocabulary today. Who's the last time you heard people use the word sin in their daily lives? We don't sin anymore, according to the world. It's our chosen lifestyle or life choices. It's what we want to do. It's our personal taste. It's being diverse. No, sin is still sin. Sin is breaking God's law. Whenever we do that, we break God's heart. It put him on the cross. That's why we mourn our sins, like you'd mourn someone who has passed away. When we look at ourselves and look at the world, how are we supposed to act in the world? We give ourselves to God. It's called being meek. Meek is God-controlledness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They have all the answers because God has given us the answers in his word. How do we look at God's word anyway? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after right doing, for they shall be filled. How do we look at others in the world in general? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. How do we look at life? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How do we look at the world in general when it comes to all the fighting and violence in the world? Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called the children of God. And how do we look at being persecuted for our righteousness? Blessed are you when you're persecuted for that, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, we're different to make a difference. And when we do that, it's only because we can't do it in ourselves. We do it because we've taken Christ into our lives through New Testament baptism. We're born again of water and spirit. Being baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. And now we live this selfless Christian life. Now, as that, when we get out of our beds in the morning, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, at our workplace, at our schools, 
we are now the salt of the earth and the light to the world. We make a difference. And because of that, being difference makers, we're not just attenders, we're not just pretenders, but we are superintenders. We are responsible for our brother and our sister in this world. We're responsible to show them the light, to salt their lives, to bring them to the Christ. Because of that, today we begin at verse 17. Now, you could imagine when the people were hearing this for the first time, they've all heard all kinds of prophets that have come along, and you wonder about this particular prophet. And he is really speaking differently. In fact, this whole sermon ends with saying, never anybody spake like this one. I mean, he's really rallying the cages here. And so, as you ever hear a preacher, your first thought in your mind is, now I know the things I learned growing up. So, is this preacher liberal or conservative? Meaning, is he going to take me into an area that we didn't go there in our religious background and thinking? And I don't know if the Bible says that or not. Or is he going to take the word and just wring it out to where it chokes you and you don't have any life in your faith. That's the two extremes. Well, you can imagine, listen to Jesus. Now, which one is he, they're thinking? And they're thinking that, that maybe, he's, maybe he's liberal because they've heard him. Would you believe this? On one occasion, she was trapped. She was uh, uh, put in this position. But Jesus had a woman caught in the very act of adultery flung at his feet as a test case to see how he would handle it. And after Christ asked him, without, if you without sin, you can cast the first stone, they all left. He didn't say, where are your accusers? She says, I don't have any. He says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He's a flaming liberal. But the next scene, Jesus is talking to people about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And he says there's only one scriptural reason for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And that's for your partner being sexually unfaithful to you. Oh, he's an ultra-conservative. I'm going to tell you this morning, our Lord was never a liberal or a conservative. Our Lord was right. He's always been right. He will always be right because he does what the Father says to do. He says what the Father said for him to say. He's right. Even this morning in our prayer, we heard the, the idea of getting our children to learn to do the right thing. That's it. Unfortunately, where's the manual to teach you how to do the right thing? It's called the Bible. And when you understand God, when you understand His Word, then you are doing not only the right thing, you're doing the Jesus thing. You're doing what Jesus would do. And that's exactly what we're about to get into now. Talking about fundamentals, when you're a little child, okay, I mean real small, and you're about to put your hand on the hot part of the stove, what happens? No. Okay. You can't explain to the child that that's going to burn them and hurt them. You can't explain that to the child. So it's very fundamental. No. Now, later on, you can touch this part of the stove anytime you want to. This part, but not this part, because it'll burn you. That's the rest of the story. Don't play in the street, or you get a spanking. Why? Well, later on, they realize because of the danger involved in that. That's the rest of the story. When the Old Testament was written, it was written for them to understand the fundamental, elementary principles of doing right and wrong. Thou shalt not, thou shalt. It was elementary principles, fundamental principles that we never outgrow. I mean, one plus one is always going to be two. And so even though you might progress into grammar school and on into high school and into college and into your career, you never leave one plus one is two or ABC. You don't leave those fundamentals. So, and look at verse 17. When they're looking to Jesus, they're thinking, he, he, this guy is way out, so he's probably here to destroy our whole old law system. And Christ says, I'm not in the destroying business. I'm in the building business. I'm in the fulfilling business. 
I came not to destroy the law of the prophets. Don't throw away your Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. And I'm going to bring those principles into a completion. Now, we're about to get into this where he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes. And folks, they were the top considered religious people of their day. And let our righteousness exceed theirs. How does my righteousness exceed anybody else's righteousness? Because under their system, Christ later on would say in the book of Romans, that they're trying to establish their own righteousness. They did it by trying to follow the letter of the law. Cross every T, dot every I. But there's much more to it than that. He gave you those principles, fundamental principles. No, for the purpose of teaching you a lesson about safety and about what you should do, where you should put your hands. Okay? Well, beginning now at verse 21, he's going to give you no less than six fundamental principles, outgrowths of the Old Testament and now the New Testament. And because as I looked at these, and I found one author that, that did this too, and I thought was really wise. I'm going to group these into two sections. I'm not going to follow the order necessarily here, but they're grouped into two sections. The first section is how we deal with our relationship with our loved ones. The second one is how we deal with the relationship with those that don't even like us, or we not even like them. Okay? So here we go. The first group we begin at actually verse 27. Now, all these begin the same way. And here he goes at verse 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. All right? Got it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Have a sexual relationship with anybody besides my marital partner. So back in the Old Testament, you could have all the different thoughts you would ever want to have, and you didn't violate any law. But when Jesus came, he said that was the law to get you to understand what is wrong. But I'm telling you, I'm going to nip it in the bud. I'm going to tell you to take it back a step to where you would never even get there. I'm going to tell you that if you ever allow yourself to lust after a person. It's like doing that very act in your own heart. So don't even allow your heart to go there. Well, brother guy, or Lord, how, how do you keep from doing that? Nothing's wrong with appreciating someone's beauty or attractiveness. It's just you don't continue that process in getting yourself into the bed with them. You don't do that. Well, how do I keep from doing that? Well, he uses a real graphic point here. He's not telling you about mutilate your body. What he says is this, pretend that you're blind. Just pluck your eyes out. Pretend that you don't have your hand. I mean, all, you hear it all the time today, inappropriate touch. Just pretend you don't have any hands and you won't go there and you'll never violate the commandment. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Then he says at verse 31, It's been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let her give her a writing of divorcement. Now the first one we just saw was a Ten Commandment. This is also not a law that God necessarily wanted, but God permitted because of the situation. Deuteronomy 24, 1, you have this listed. But in Matthew 19, we're told why. The people had gotten so hardened in their hearts about keeping their spouse the way they should, the only way to get rid of them was to kill them. They didn't have any way to divorce. And so Moses gave them this writ of divorcement to put them away. But from the beginning, it was not so. God always wanted one man, one woman for life. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That was God's plan. But when, because of this situation, listen to what Jesus says. Now, I know that's in the books, he says. Let me tell you what I'm saying. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife 
a saving except for the cause of sexual immorality. And marries another, commits adultery. Why is that? Because God doesn't recognize that divorce. It wasn't for the right reason. So your second marriage is not a second marriage. It's an adulterous situation. Even the person that's innocent that you brought into that, perhaps, in your marriage. What is he saying to us? If you look back at the order here now, if I never lust, I'll never get there. If I never get there, we don't have divorce. Amen? That's where he's getting at. It's not just crossing the T's and dotting the I's. It's having the heart of God. That's what he's trying to get us to. It's not just the letter of the law. It's the Spirit. Then he says in verse 33, Again, you've heard it has been said of them of old, Thou shalt not forswear thyself. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, back in those days, and we have it today, you've heard the expression, I don't know how many times a day, I swear to. And the Bible says, don't do that. Leviticus 19, 14. Don't ever use God's name in vain. Don't do that. Well, through the years, these so-called men of God thought they could help out God and help man out by giving what we call euphemisms. It's not using God's name, but it's using something else. So he goes on to say here, you say, I swear by heaven. That's where God lives. I swear by something on earth. I swear by my mother's grave. The earth is God's footstool. I swear by Jerusalem, it's God's city. I swear by thy hairs on my head, God made you. You can't go and use anything else without using God because God made everything. Okay? What's he doing? He's taking that out of your vocabulary. You don't forswear at all. But you do keep your oath. Now, what is the most important oath besides our voice and our actions in the baptistry of being one with God? What's the most important oath you ever make in your life? I take thee for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. These all go together, folks. It's being pure with God. Keep your oaths. In fact, from now on, he says, you don't even have to to have an oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Whatever else comes from the devil. You have to add to your word. Your word is your bond if you're a Christian. We're different to make a difference. And then he has the next three. And these three deal with relationship with man when we don't even like them. They don't like us. What do you do with that? Begin at verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Now, ever since Cain killed Abel, that's always been a no-no. Nobody will have any tolerance for a murderer. It's always been a life for a life in a sense. Even he says here, you're going to face the judgment. You kill somebody. Okay. You've heard it four times say. But now he says in verse 22, but I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother. Let's get to the heart of the matter. You're never going to kill anybody if you're not angry at them. Meaning murder here. Let's get to the heart of the matter. He does say this, angry without a cause. There is what's called righteous anger. Jesus had that in Mark 3 and verse 5. Jesus was... Knew he, again, he was being trapped. The Pharisees wanted to trap him, so they brought a man with a withered hand into the temple on the Sabbath day, and they know his heart, his merciful heart. He wants to help that man. If he heals him on the Sabbath day, foul, you broke the Sabbath day laws about working on the Sabbath day. When Jesus saw their hearts, it angered him. How can you be so callous? He went ahead and healed a man. On maybe one or even two occasions, some think, 
when Jesus went into the temple and saw that men, people traveled a long way to come to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice to God. Some of them couldn't bring their sacrifice with them. They had to buy it when they got there. So they made it real convenient. You go right into the temple, had little shops set up for you to buy your sacrifices for an exorbitant price, and they were even blemished. Jesus couldn't stand it. He was angry, and he drove them out of his father's temple. He didn't sin, be angry and sin. Not. He didn't have bad thoughts about it. He just said, why are you making my father's house a den of thieves? There, you can get angry at sin. You can get angry at what the world has done with sin in, in their lives and done to our lives. That's righteous indignation. But not to take vengeance upon someone. Violence. Oh, no. Listen to what he says here. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment of God. And whoso shall say to his brother, Raka, Raka, that means empty headed one. Watch your language. I mean, if you, you won't allow your children to call each other empty headed or moron, you're not going to let that go, are you? You say, you don't talk to your brother that way. If you're in public and somebody calls my mom, that's not nice. And you're right. Doing the right thing. You're right. He's, that's what he means by the counsel here. Even the counsel of other people, they say that's not right. You call somebody a fool. You're saying you don't even know how to go to heaven. You don't you even know how to please God. You're a foolish person. You've got to answer to God for that. Watch your heart, for out of the heart the mouth speaks. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, you come to church on Sunday, and they rem remember it's that thy brother hath aught against you. You've got a problem with somebody in the church there. Don't even make it here yet. Go to them and make it right privately. And then come and offer your sacrifice. Because you can't worship God. God says, how can you say you love me if you hate your brother? You can't love me. You can't serve me. You can't worship me. Make it right with your brother today, real quickly. Nip it in the bud. Lest he get a hold of you and throw you into prison. Now, again, I think it's figurative here. He's talking about if we don't get it right, we have to live with the prison of hate in our own hearts. And it's worse than any prison alive. Make your heart right with God. He then says in verse 34, excuse me, verse 38, you have been, it's been said of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, you say, that's not in the Bible. It's all through the Bible. Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all have this law. That's so unfair. No. Actually, it was given and it was called the justice law. Because, let's say somebody purposely knocked out one of your teeth. Then, justice, you knock out one of them. Not two, one. Somebody takes out one of your eyes, then you take out one of their eyes. That's justice. But now, let's face it. None of us want justice today. With God or man, we want what? Mercy. Right? We want mercy. And that's what Christ is going to offer here. And this day is was, was a keep from being over with one by one, doing something to you, you over the other, trying to keep it on the same plane. But notice what he says here. But I say unto you, that you resist not evil. For whoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, so the response would be, right, hit them on the right cheek. Turn to him the other also. What? Let me tell you what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean to run. It doesn't mean just to take it without doing something about it. Because I'm talking about our example. Jesus was slapped. Do you remember? Christ didn't just stand there quietly. He said, why did you hit me? He wanted to know a reason for it. And the person said, because you're talking to the high priest. Well, actually, he wasn't the high priest recognized anymore. 
Annas was the high priest, but they had ousted him and put Caiaphas, his son-in-law, in. And so Christ is really correcting them. I wasn't speaking out of turn to the high priest. He's not the high priest. But he was standing his ground. Now, I'll tell you even maybe as, as good as an example as that. I love this church family. We got a young man in our congregation. He's in our class on Wednesday night. He's 12 years old. His name is Christian. He was named right. That young man has a heart for God. He was over at his friend's house not too long ago playing these video games. The boy's big brother was picking on Christian. I'm going to beat you up because I know karate. Christian says, if you really know karate, the first two rules of karate is you don't use it on beating up people. The kid walked away. That's what he's talking about. Use your head. Use your heart. Turn the other cheek. If somebody tries to sue you at law, and we live in a sue-happy society today. I mean, we do. People sue you for anything. The Lord says, you know what's more important than material things? is a person's soul. So he's using an extravagant situation, but he says, if he wants your inside garment, which they could sue for in those days. They could not sue for the outside garment. That, that was used also as a blanket at night to keep you warm. Give them your outside blanket too. What? More important than winning a case is winning a soul. Well, what about somebody who comes to you and uh, in this day it was, it was the way they did it. A Roman soldier, because the Romans had the Christians under their thumb, and the Jews say, hey Jew, come here, Christian, and take my pack with me a mile. You carry my pack for me. And because Romans had them under their thumb, they had to do that, Roman law. But if you know anybody, somebody would, would figure out how many steps that would take. And when they got to the one mile, they'd drop their pack in a huff and go back to their business, and a soldier would probably be laughing and say, hey, you, 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 come here for the next mile. Can you imagine this Roman soldier one day? He got a Christian, didn't realize it. And they're carrying him that one mile, and when they get to that final step, you know what happens? He keeps on going. He keeps right on going. And the soldier starts laughing for a minute. He says, he doesn't know what he's doing. Finally, he says, he can't break it. He says, you moron, do you realize that you've gone more than a mile? And he says, oh, yeah. But you told me you're going here today. I'm going to carry it the rest of the way for you. What? Why would you do that? Because I know the Christ. Can I share the Christ with you? What do you think? He wants you to go one mile, go with him too. And then we have this last section, which is so powerful. Probably one of the hardest things in the world to do as a Christian, but here it is. We're talking, we went from fundamentals to real deep in Christianity now. Look at this. You have heard, it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, you talk about mankind. We know that Leviticus 19, 18 says, love your neighbor. We even know that of the, all the commandments, the Lord says the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We know that. But how man can put two and two together and get five? If I love my neighbor, I can hate my enemy. That was kind of the rule of the day. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. You heard it said that, he says. That's never been said in the Bible. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, who do we know in this world who allow that to happen to him? Who do we know who allowed himself to be cursed, who did good to them that hated him, who prayed for them, despitefully used him, persecuted him? His name was Jesus. He's our example. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. This morning when God had the sun rise up in the morning. That same sun that shone into a house that the people were getting ready for church. Shone on the next door neighbor. Who got up after partying all night. 
and have no help, no hope for God. In fact, they even make fun of the next door neighbors who are going to spend their Sunday at a building where they could be out enjoying Myrtle Beach and all of its attractions. And may even put them down for that. But God had the same sun to shine on their house as on your house. Why? God says, I want you to treat your enemies the way I treat my enemies. In the same way. That you be like me. For if you love them that love you, what reward have you? Everybody does that. Even the publicans and sinners love the people that love them. Be you therefore mature, complete, perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is mature or complete or perfect. Be like Jesus. If you do the right thing, you're doing what Jesus does. And it's completely delivered from the world. And you'll be called a Christian, a Christ-like it. You'll be different to make a difference. But you build on the fundamentals. You have to be before you can do. You have to be a Christian before you can act like one. So this morning, if you've not been baptized into Christ, that's how you become a Christian. And we have the baptistry ready behind me. You can be baptized this morning, have all your sins washed away, and be born again of water and spirit. Be that Christian that you want and need to be. If you've already been baptized but haven't been living this life at all, you've been like everybody else in the world, they'd be shocked if they found out you were a Christian because you haven't been acting like one. This morning you come forward, we'll pray with you and for you because we are different to make a difference. That's the fundamental fact of our faith. We're just supposed to be like Jesus. Will you come?